talk, he's just going to be talking about the acoustic work and some of the other tagging work we've done on the skate building and what Jane was talking about. Um, it's a good opportunity for me because I've worked with so many of you on boats and stuff, it's good to show you that I actually do something proper when I'm not out with you guys as well, so it's a good opportunity to, to show that. Uh, first and foremost, I'm actually going to start with the thank yous rather than ending on them because if it wasn't for the people on this list, there would be no talk at all. So there's been so many people involved in this project, which has been great. It's a marine protected area, it's out there, there's an awful lot of people using that area, so it's really good that so many people have come on board with this got interested in it, contributed to it in many different ways. Um, there's maybe people on there I've listed, if I have, I do apologise, um, but that thank you is a really genuine one because, as I said, none of this would have happened without each and every one of you, so thank you. So what is it all about? What have I been doing? What have we been doing going out on the boats, fishing? As much as we enjoy it, there is actually a genuine purpose to this. Um, the main aim of everything that this project entails, as well as the wider work, is to conserve and manage Scottish elasma banks, which are sharks, skates and rays. Uh, there's fisheries legislation, as Jane mentioned, through total allowable catches, prohibition of landing, um, and things like real-time closures, which have actually been experimented on for the spur dog in certain areas in the Celtic Sea. We might have species-specific legislation, such as the Wildlife and Countryside Act with the basking shark that prevents people intentionally interfering or harassing this species. Um, we have things like CITES, which, which limits and controls the trade between countries on goods from these species, such as the meat or, in some cases, fins. But the one that we're here to talk to you about today is marine protected areas, which is obviously another piece of the legislation and management tool that we have to conserve shark, skate and ray numbers. Because we've got such a wide breadth of people in the audience, I thought I'd give a brief sum as to what, uh, what is actually a marine protected area. It's quite literally a map with a line on it, and within that line is some form of management. This can come in many different forms, depending on the species. Um, as Jane sort of began to mention, these animals we're looking at, the, the skate are incredibly large animals, and the spur dog move all over the place, so... This kind of management for such a mobile species is really only useful in areas where maybe the animals smell, uh, spend a disproportionate amount of their time, such as residents in the area or repeated return behaviour to that same area. Um, again, because those shark populations split into the different sizes and the different ages, this tends to mean that maybe a marine protected area only is effective on a single age or sex class at a time. Um, and generally speaking, in the marine environment, we tend to look at marine protected areas as only being useful for the early life history stages for nursery areas. This is a bit of a throwback from normal fish management, such as cod, where they have the big spawning grounds, and you've got a lot of fry going into the water at the same time, so the protection of that area is protecting millions of individuals at the same time. Um, because elasma bank management is relatively new using marine protected areas, we've kind of stolen that idea from the fisheries, but there's a slight problem with this because it's not always effective. Elasma bank nursery grounds tend to be naturally protected areas, estuaries, embayments, shallow areas in coastal waters. They can include reef systems, including deep water coral. Some deep water sharks use these as egg laying grounds. But as those sharks grow, their home ranges naturally increase. They develop the ability to swim further. They can swim further afield. And what this means in reality is that an animal that starts off its life in a small embayment like that will actually end up growing and moving out of that embayment into the open ocean or further coastal reaches until we get to a point where you might well have a marine protected area that it moves out of and it gets fished. Elasma banks have very slow life history. Spur dog won't reproduce until they're about 15 years old. That's 15 years, so say the first year of its life spent within that nursery area, it's got 14 years of swimming in the open ocean when it's got a chance of being fished out that it hasn't had a chance to reproduce and give back to the population. And if that animal's fished out, we get the possibility of that late maturity that we don't have a nursery anymore, so that marine protected area is now null and void because there's no nursery area left. That does suggest that we need to look at marine protected areas, but also fisheries management, perhaps, and combine those two into a useful management tool to make sure that we can conserve populations. But there are certain behaviours within shark populations that we're looking at. This is what we're interested in, such as site fidelity, where an animal's swimming around and comes back to the same area. If that return behaviour tends to be within reproduction, such as nursery ground, then it's a natal philopatric behaviour. 
And all of a sudden, that marine protected area is not only protecting the nursery grounds, it's always protecting the adult females that are returning for a certain proportion of the time. So it's really, understand, it's really important that we understand these movement behaviours so we can begin to look if those marine protected areas are actually going to be effective or not. Now, looking at movement in sort of broad brush strokes to really understand it, we can, we can normally break it down into three components. So the, the daily movement of an animal over a 24-hour period, this is normally associated with feeding or resting behaviours. Over a year, seasons, there's maybe offshore movements into cooler waters over the summer or warmer waters over the winter, depending on the temperature niches of those animals. And also ontogenetic shifts. Now what this is, is as that animal grows, it's going to increase in body size, so its energy demands, it's maybe going to change its prey species. So it's going to need to move to different habitats in order to satisfy its different energy demands. So it's going to need to seek different habitats as it grows. It's really important that we understand all three categories of this when we come to management, because it needs to be a nice holistic approach to, to covering each management base. Obviously, the big problem with a lot of the animals that we work on, especially in Scotland, is they tend to live on the seafloor, up to 200 metres deep and beyond in many cases. So how do we actually monitor these? I mean, things like basking sharks, you can get real-time observationals. You can see the dorsal fins in surface waters, so you can begin to track them. We also have certain technologies, such as the acoustics, which I'll talk about in a bit, that can do real-time monitoring of these animals in the water. And we also have the ability to collect data on where the animal's been, the different water habitats, which is the archival tagging, which is the second part of this project, which I'll be talking to you about. And once we get that data, we can take it back and we can process it again to try and rebuild those animal movements depending on the data that these tags are collected. So, first of all, we've got the acoustic tagging. Some of you will be very familiar with this um, because I've been pulling up various bits of kits on your boat or deploying tags off the boats. Um, but what they do is the tags that we attach to the animals transmit a unique acoustic signal. This is very much like Morse code, so each individual tag has a number associated with it. Then we'll have a, a network of acoustic array in the area, these hydrophones which are specially programmed to communicate with the tags. And every time a tag comes within a certain distance of the receiver, which is about 500 metres after testing, you'll get a date and time stamp and an ID number to know that that tag, and therefore the animal it was attached to, hopefully, was in the area. A couple of examples of this acoustic technology, you might have a few receivers up a river mouth to track movement up and down, such as salmon migration, it's very useful for. You might have a network in an area like we used in the marine protected area to look at movement around a certain area. Or even if you live in nice hot tropical places and you've got lots of boats, you can hang a hydrophone over the side and actually chase these animals about individually. So the acoustic software is really useful, but what it doesn't really do is tell us much about what the animal is actually doing in the water. It's more of a presence and absence tool. So if you want to understand more about what the animal is doing in the water, we're going to deploy archival tags. These tags have different sensors depending on what you've bought. We tend to use depth and temperature, but they record environmental parameters. So every predetermined length, they're recording that environmental data. It can be anything from one or two seconds, up to five minutes and they'll last from anything from a few days up to two or three years. We do need to recapture the fish to get these tags back unfortunately. So the acoustic tags are limited because as soon as a fish leaves the acoustic range we've no idea where they've gone. The archival tags are brilliant at filling in those gaps as long as we can get them back to actually get our hands on the data. As I mentioned this project used a combination of both. Now each of these tags is about the size of an AA battery but a little shorter. Um, we use SAR audio mini tags at two minute resolution, so they're recording depth and temperature every two minutes. And the acoustic tags we use, I mean, they're, they're the manufacturer names, but what's important is they're sending off a signal every 60 to 90 seconds. Now, the reason we've got that range is if you've got tags always going off at 60 seconds, if they combine with each other, you actually get a false signal because the sound signal gets mixed up in the water. So by splitting, by making sure that acoustic signal is firing off at different intervals, the idea is that they won't overlap too much and we won't get confusion on the receivers. This is a picture of the MPA. This is a lot of to sound of MPA, as Jane discussed. And we had two main study sites in here in the Firth of Lawn, which was the skate work. We also had Locative, which was for the spur dog work. Um, I'm going to talk to you mostly about the skate work here, but I will talk about the spur dog work a little later as well. Um, briefly, just to go over, over some of the things Jane did, 15 years maturity, so it's only at 15 years that the females start to reproduce. 
30 to 60 eggs is a figure that we've seen, but we've never actually seen the research behind this to prove this, so there's actually a question mark at the end of that one. They're very large when they're born. The, the skate in the upper picture is possibly only one or two months old. Um, now, the problem being born at that size when you, when you come out of the egg cases is you're immediately vulnerable to being caught accidentally in by catching trawl gear and things, hence, hence the effectiveness sometimes of mobile gear restrictions in areas. They're very long-lived. The estimates are over 100 years. Um, and historically, in the 80s, there have been documented cases of localised extinction in the Irish Sea, the North Sea, these animals, the flapper skate or the common skate have actually being completely removed from those areas. So the acoustic array we used is the hydrophones I was talking about with the acoustic array. We had approximately 40 receivers throughout the marine protected area. Now, despite that number of receivers, that only equivalates with the 500 metres detection radius to about 16% coverage of the marine protected area. So that's quite important note. So if an animal's not detected by our receivers, it doesn't necessarily mean it's not in the MPA. Um, as I mentioned, once it's out the detection range, we do have a problem in identifying where it's been, which is why we've got the other data set. So, in total, we tagged 65 fish with archival tags, the ones that are recording depth and temperature every two minutes. 43 of these had acoustic tags also added to them. You can see the two tags, the white archival tag on the left wing and the black acoustic tag on the right wing. Um, we put reward posters up to try and encourage people to return tags if they caught the fish, and we had some really <laughs> successful returns. Uh, 27 females and 16 males in total. Uh, just wanted to show you a couple of what I think of as interesting video clips, if it's going to work. So this is a fish going back into the water. It's a male. We can see the clusters on the back. A lot of the time we get asked about impacts of tagging on things of skates. Um, what we're looking for are fit and healthy fish. If we're not thinking that they're fit and healthy, we won't tag them and they go back. This animal's had two tags and it swims off nice and strongly. That's what we're always aiming for. That's what we're always hoping for with our tag fish. Um, nice healthy fish going back into the depths and instantly recording data for us. We have two main tagging sites in the yellow. So just off Inch Island and off the Isle of Kerou as well. What the red dots on this map show is they're the locations of each receiver that we had in the Firth of Lawn. The size of those circles equivalates to how many acoustic detections we had from all the fish in total. So you can see some of these receiver units in the southern curtain just between South Kerr and the Isle of Man had up to 50,000 detections over the course of one year. So that's between March 2016 to about April 2017. That's not 50,000 fish, obviously. That could be one fish sat next to a receiver and continually pinging every 30 to 60 seconds, which it wasn't, but that could have been it. Um, so you can instantly see that there's a lot more detections in the south near the tagging sites, which you might expect in animals that display high residency. But there was some movement up into the north of the MPA and into the Sound of Jura. What this looks like on what we call a detection plot, where we've got time along the bottom and the identification of the individual skate up the y-axis, the green marks show when the tag was attached to the fish, the red marks show when the tag was removed from the fish, and each individual black mark shows when that fish was detected by the acoustic array as a whole. You can see some females, such as number 25 here, had almost year-long residency within that array. Other skate, much shorter, a few pings and then it disappeared. They're all for the females, and you can see the nice long residency of the females, but if we look at the males, we've got a slightly different picture. Now, bear in mind, we did tag less males. So we had one tagging event for the males that just stayed in the most and disappeared. A second tagging event here, again, that kind of sporadic residency in the MPA. So straight away from this data, it suggests that males and females are using the area that was detected with the acoustic range a little differently. I'm just going to play a short video clip. We've got the males and females split into two different colours, blue and red. There's a time and date stamp up in the top left corner. And this is going to be for the full year-long acoustic deployment. And it, all it's going to show is which receivers were pinged at different dates. The darker and heavier the circle, the more fish were detected. So this isn't per fish, this is just per sex, per receiver. So if it's going to work, there we go. So we can see lots of activity on that southern curtain, but we do get those occasional pings up in the north where the fish have obviously moved from those tagging sites and have gone up to the side of Lismore where there's a deep hole, up into the Sound of Mull, and they're really actually moving around quite a lot. The dominance of red marks there is not only indicative of the fact that we tagged so many females, but it's the females that are really staying 
in that area throughout. But we can see as we begin to get to the sort of winter months, October, November, the blue circles and males start to come back into the south. And in a moment, they're going to start pinging the receivers up in the sound of Mull and Lismore. So we can see that difference between the sexes moving and using the MPA. Again, when the water starts to warm up in the spring, we see less males beginning to, to, to activate the receivers, and it's mostly females. Okay. If you look at the proportion of tag skate detected throughout the duration of the project, we can see that females obviously started off at higher, a high proportion of 90% of the females were detected. This slowly decreased to an average of about 40% detection by the array. Males, by, uh, by comparison, instantly low portion of males tagged, so they're obviously moving out the area, slowly decreasing until none of those tagged fish from the initial tagging event were detected in July. The second tagging event that we had obviously put that proportion back up to about the same 60%, and again they decreased off down to about 10 to 20% of the fish were actually detected. Again, that's showing the movement that the previous animation showed where the females are staying while the males seem to look like they're moving away. Um, just a quick plot to show that the females were detected between zero up to 300 days for the acoustic duration so for that year that the acoustics were in, while the males, however, 95% of them were detected less than 50 days, so they're really not using that MPA area very heavily at all. Um, the temperature data that we got from these tags, from the archival tags, sorry, um, is really interesting. So that's a standard temperature cycle, which is obviously following the seasons over, over the years from March 2016 through to the following year in July 2017. Uh, one thing of interest in here is this slight anomaly in the temperature, where the temperature got very high. We know this is a recapture event, so this has gone onto Ronnie's boat, which is obviously doing something on there to keep everything nice and hot. <laughs> That's what these temperatures normally are doing. It's really interesting for us to see these, though, because we can begin to see when fish are recaptured as well. Just to show you a couple of the, the sort of individual fish data we've got. This one was an interesting one, a female with a stunted tail. Um, she was tagged 20,200 detections over the course of one year. Most of those, as you can see by the size of the circles, are in the south of the MPA. We get a nice depth cycle. So that's the, that's the raw depth data. So every two minutes, that depth's recording. The temperature cycle, and also the number of detections throughout the year. So she was, she was present in the MPA fairly much from March 2016 through to March 2017. Another female, a little smaller, but again, similar high detection rate at 20,900 over the course of the project. Again, very heavy use of that southern curtain. Now, if we look at the data, the depth plot throughout shows, uh, shows its depth use, temperature usage, and again, the detections on the acoustics show that it was present in that MPA pretty much throughout the year. Conversely, if we have a look at a couple of males, just in comparison, a nice big male here only had 1,500 detections. Heavy use of the south curtain and the sound of mum. If we look at the depth data, the temperature data, we can see from this period, from about April through to October 2016, there was no detections on the acoustic array, so it's obviously out of range, it's gone somewhere else. Came back in in about October and over the winter and through into next spring, it had sporadic attendance in that acoustic array area. Um, an even more extreme example is another male with only 75 detections in the south. And if we look at the data, we can actually see that it was present in the acoustic array between March the 18th March the 22nd, so immediately after tagging, and it moved away. But the animals recaptured in the MPA, so we know it's gone somewhere and come back. These depth ranges are really interesting. This was one of the deepest diving fish we had. It went down to nearly 300 metres, which would place it nearly off the shelf edge, or perhaps in an area such as Beaufort's Dyke off the north of Ireland. Using these depths, we can try and limit the areas where it could have gone, and we can begin to reconstruct while this animal's gone, but at the moment we're still working on models that can cope with that. One of the uh, more, the, the furthest recapture we had was a female skate that was recaptured in Malig after one year. So this was recently returned to us in July. Um, and the, the data from this one doesn't look much different to the others. It hasn't got that deep depth, but at some point it's obviously moved and gone north. A couple of interesting things that we can begin to pick up, things like depth data, is if we look at the period over the summer months. If skates are animals that like cooler temperatures, it might mean in the summer when the, the seawater's warmed up in surface, the skater remained down in deeper waters. 
while in the winter when that sort of temperature cools down and the, and the stratification in the water, the, the different temperature layers have broken up, the animals become much more active, moving back up into the surface waters. Um, just a quick plot of the different depths used. We can see in March through to about August, the animals have mostly stayed in shallow waters, under 100 metres. They then begin to move up and use very shallow waters. And in fact, in January, it's using waters mostly above 50 metres. This kind of data, the acoustic and that depth data combined, actually present us with a really unique opportunity in the marine environment to have a look at some really fine-scale habitat use. Now, if an animal is detected, we know it's within the certain range of this acoustic receiver array. <coughs> We're lucky enough to have some very fine-scale bathymetry data for this area, about two, minute, two meter resolution. Now, if we focus on this southern curtain, which is where most of the animals were detected, we can put that on top of that depth data, the bathymetry. After range testing extensively, we know that each receiver unit listens to about 500 metres in any given direction. So the black line around those receivers is that 500 metre detection radius. So if we look at one of our fish's data sets, and if I just take this little chunk between June and July, you can see there's an awful lot of depths at about 160 metres. It's also got a lot of acoustic detections which happen to all be on that southern acoustic array. So if I look at all the depths at 160 metres in that area, it's a very small area, just highlighted in red. And if we further narrow that down by that acoustic range, we can actually see that that fish has spent an awful lot of time in a really small area, only a couple of kilometres square. And it's spent that two months pretty much exclusively in that area. There's obviously a few other points. You know, we've got these deep dives down past 200 metres, about 180 metres. We can really use that to narrow that depth range right down to find out exactly almost the hole that that animal's sitting in within that acoustic range. If we add things in, such as maybe sea surface temperature or water column temperature, habitat type, we can really begin to understand how skate are using these areas. And that kind of data doesn't exist in the marine environment. So this is not only a unique site in terms of being a marine protected area for a skate or a shark species, but in the sort of interest in understanding how these animals use the natural environment, it's, it's fairly unique, to be honest with you. Um, and the fact that we have the presence of those small skate in this area mean that we can actually begin to look at how the animals change their behaviour from the small size out of the egg cases through to the adult size as well. So just to, just to quickly summarise the skate data, um, we have high occupancy in the MPA by females. Males appear to move out of the area, and at the moment we're still unaware where they're going, but we are building models to try and answer that. They do seem to prefer the deep water in the south around the acoustic curtain, um, and we do have that amazing opportunity to study fine-scale habitat use and maybe even social behaviour to the same skate move around the acoustic array together. So that was the skate project in brief. I know that probably felt like a long time we've seen me talk and apologise, but there's so much data that this project's producing, and it's really important that we can convey to you guys the importance of it and, and sort of uniqueness of this as, an, as a potential, not just for understanding an MPA, but also for understanding the species wider in other areas of Scotland as well. So moving on to the spur dog, which Jane introduced very nicely, so I can live out, skip out some of this. Important things to know about this is we have suffered a 95% reduction estimated in biomass of this species in the northeast Atlantic over the last 100 years. Critically endangered due to this. Um, it's late to mature, and it also has a tendency to be viewed as a very highly migratory species. Tagging studies showed these guys moving all around the UK, from up near Shetland, down to the south coast, down to the Bay of Biscay. They seem to use the entire shelf edge on the northeast Atlantic. But as Jane mentioned, we began to look at areas, and especially Loch Etiv, and it, it almost seemed like the behaviour is a little different there, so we really set out to look at what they're doing in Loch Etiv. Um, for those of you not familiar with Loch Etiv, we've got from the Falls of Law up to the headwater, the lock's basically comprised of two deep basins that are separated by these sills. Go in the top basin, north of Benor Quarry, it goes down to about 145 metres. And what these sills do is they actually trap water, and it creates this sort of temperature anomaly where the water in the upper basin is actually warmer at depth. So the idea is that maybe these animals are using this trap water as a kind of thermal refuge. Rather than over winter having to move offshore to warmer waters, they can stay in the lock to make use of that warmer temperature environment. We have three tagging sites in the lock, um, just beyond the Falls of Laura, uh, in this lower basin and also in the upper basin. 
Now, the spur dog, we tagged 59 spur dog in total, but only with acoustic tags. We tagged eight out in the Firth of Lawn opportunistically when we were doing the skate tagging. But the main spur dog study was 42 in the locative and nine just outside beyond the Falls of Law. Um, there was a slight sex differentiation in the fact that Falls of Law we only caught females, so they were the only ones we could tag. Now, the tagging for these are a little different to the skate. Um, due to the size of them, we have the opportunity to anaesthetize them, and we can, uh, excuse me, we can actually surgically insert the tags. It, these go into the stomach cavity. There's actually a lot of space, um, and you can get these tags into the, into the sort of gap between the organs in the stomach cavity. So we make a small slit, insert the tags, and stitch them up. So these tags are internal. They can't fall off, so we know if a fish is detected that the tag's still attached. And we don't have to take things like tag removal, tag shedding into account either. So it actually makes for a lot more uh, assurance that detections are real, that the fish is still there. The etib array, comprised of a further 10 acoustic receivers, one at the mouth near the falls of oil, and nine at various intervals up Loch Etib. We stuck to the deeper water because we know that Spurdog do prefer deeper water. Um, now... If you remember the skate detection plots, we had that kind of sporadic detection where one or two fish showed high residency, but most of them sort of had sporadic. In comparison, the spur dog in Loch Etib have a lot higher residency. Now you see a few blue dots in there. These are fish that were picked up by the Firth of Lawn Acoustic Array, while all the black dots were picked up by the Loch Etib Array. This is just a female, so we can see that females tagged. All fish were tagged at the same time, so we don't have that kind of double tagging episode but we have a very high residency in the Loch Etib Acoustic Array. And the males don't show a very different story. Now, the reason that we've got this gap at the front of the black dots is that the Firth of Lawn Spur Dog were tagged a little earlier in March. They were all male. So all these... So all those fish there, are the male Spur Dog tagged and detected in the Firth of Lawn Array. So we can see that they've stayed out in the Firth of Lawn while all the males tagged in July were detected fairly much the whole year through in Loch uh, Similar animation to the other one, split into sexes again over the course of the project. Uh, and we can just really begin to see how the males and females are using those receiver ranges in Loch Etib. Immediately there seems to be a bit of a split between the lower basin and the upper basin, with males preferring the upper basin, with females in the lower basin. This does change as the year progresses, and the water is going to cool down, and that warm water in the upper basin is going to become more important to both sexes. Males seem to move further up into the lock, into the higher headland waters, while the females tend to stay around the Bonor Quarry area. That does change again as the waters begin to warm up a little bit. Um, but this kind of information is showing that there's always fish detected in Loch Etib. You know, they're moving around, the detections are pinging. Uh, if nothing else, this shows us that a fish hasn't simply died and sat next to a receiver unit. I mean, it sounds a stupid question, but you know, some people do say, how do you know that? And it's by this movement up and down between the receivers that we know that these fish are alive and moving, which is, is really good information. Looking at the proportion of fish detected, we can see that fairly, pretty much the entire length of the project, we had over 80% of the fish detected in both sexes as well, so there's no seemable difference in the fish moving out, males moving out, females moving out, they all seem to stay in the lock. 95% of all fish were detected for more than 250 days within Loch Etib. Not much difference between the sexes again. So just to summarise that, there's that figure I mentioned, 95% over the 250 days with a high number of tags detected. There's seasonal movement in the Firth of Lawn with Spur Dog pinging a few detections in the Firth of Lawn Acoustic Array, moving away over winter and then coming back in the spring. Um, but this kind of data presents an amazing opportunity to look at how those different sex and size categories are moving together. As Jane mentioned, they're cannibalistic. They need to separate, otherwise you've got a severe population issue. Um, so we need to see how those different sizes are uh, moving around the lot. Um, and we can also begin to look at how those individuals respond to temperature as well. To summarise the whole project, using those different data sources, the acoustic and the archival, really allows us to study many aspects of that species, spatial ecology, both in the skate and also the spur dog. This data is useful to inform management, we promise you that. It, it, you know, this, that's the whole point in this project, to make sure the marine protected area is being used, managed effectively. Um, and it really is essential to incorporate all those different data types to understand the full picture, because otherwise you only get parts of a picture. So by bringing them all together, including the pit tagging data and the photo work that Stephen's going to talk to you about later, every aspect of that's an important piece all by itself 
if you bring them together, they present something really quite unique in this area. Um, that is enough for me. I apologise for going on, but uh, I hope that's informed you as to what the project's been about.